Thanks everybody for coming. I'm excited to talk about this. I have a passion for this. Um, and there's been some really exciting things that come that came along in the last 10 to 15 years of joint replacement surgery. And we're gonna talk about that. Um, and we're gonna get a little technical, so you guys are gonna have to think a little bit like a surgeon yourself, and hopefully you'll come out of this understanding what the advantages are of some of these newer techniques, okay? Um, <clears throat> a little bit about myself. I, for those of you who don't know, I am originally from the Hazleton area. My family's been there for five generations. Um, they had a law firm that started in 1923, but I found law about as exciting as a funeral, so I'm in medicine. So, <laughs> um, and so with that, I went to Penn State undergraduate. I went to osteopathic medical school in Philly, uh, and then I did my residency at what is now UPMC Pinnacle Health, where we did high volumes of joint replacements. Um, several hundred, 400 hip replacements, 600 knee replacements a year during my training, and all kinds, primary and revision knee replacement. Um, after I finished residency, I came back to the Hazleton area where I practiced for nine years. And then I took an opportunity out of the area near the Delaware Beach um, and went down there for three years. It happened to be at the same time as COVID. Um, and I found out two things about living at the beach. It's beautiful and there's god awful traffic. And, <laughs> and so my family is still here and I came back to the area and I was excited to come back and work for Lehigh Valley who is now in my hometown and is in uh, the Hazleton area. And so I see patients at multiple locations, uh, including this clinic here. And I, this is my newest clinic that I've started at. And I'm excited to bring what I learned, not only while I was away, but what I'm doing at Hazleton to this community as well. Um, so enough about me. We're gonna dive right in here and talk about arthritis. Arthritis is the reason that most joint replacements are done. In fact, it is the primary reason to do a joint replacement. Arthritis in one form or another means a damage to the surface of the joint. But there are multiple changes that occur, and arthritis is a big picture condition, okay? Um, we know that the joint surfaces lose the soft, squishy cartilage, what we call articular cartilage. And if you break open the turkey leg, you see that white stuff on the end of the bone? That is cartilage or articular cartilage. And those turkeys are slaughtered at a young age, so they have thick cartilage. And when we're young, we have thick cartilage in our knees and our hips and our joints. But as we get older and arthritis sets in, that can thin out. We also see, you may see torn meniscus. I have a lot of patients that come in and say, well, I know I have arthritis, but I have a meniscus tear, so can't we just deal with the meniscus tear? And the answer is no. The, the research is very clear that if you, only, if you treat meniscus tears in the setting of pre-existing arthritis, you're not gonna get better and you're not gonna get the result that you're looking for. We know that the fluid in the joint, the joint relies, knees and hips, they all rely on something called synovial fluid, which is a lubricating thick fluid that provides some uh, frictionless motion within the joint. Um, that gets very watered down as arthritis sets in. That's part of the big picture. And it can be associated with inflammation. We see different causes of arthritis, um, and these are the main ones. Osteoarthritis is the wear and tear arthritis that most of us have. Tend to get those little nodules at the end of your fingertips right here. Um, we see autoimmune arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid is where the uh, immune system is attacking the joint. And people like that, you'll notice in their hands, their fingers kind of go off to the side. And that can be a sign of rheumatoid arthritis. Post-traumatic arthritis. We've done, and I've done, joint replacements in patients in their 20s for post-traumatic arthritis. They had an accident or an injury that resulted in early arthritis in the joint and infectious arthritis. Bacterial infection, sometimes viral, but mostly bacterial. It can, when the bacteria sets in there, it can eat away at the cartilage. And um, when that happens, the cartilage doesn't grow back. Once you've lost it, it doesn't regenerate. And there's all kinds of stuff about stem cells and how we can regenerate joints, but we're not there yet. The research on that stuff is promising, but it's experimental, and we're still a good ways away from being able to regenerate a joint, okay? So why would somebody need a joint replacement? Well, the big reason is daily pain, okay? Quality of life. If that damage to the joint is preventing you from doing things that you used to enjoy, and a joint replacement will give you back the ability to do those things with good odds and good certainty, it's worth going through it. It's not worth going through it until you've reached that point. If you find that you can't walk as far as you used to be able to do, you can't do activities that you used to be able to do, and especially if it's affecting your, your physical and mental well-being, at that point, a joint replacement is reasonable to consider. 
We're going to talk a little bit about anatomy because we have to in order to get into the uh, discussion of advancements here. This is <coughs> a knee joint, typical knee joint. It is not a true hinge joint. People think the knee is just a hinge, like a forward and backward motion of the knee. But it's not. The biomechanics of the knee are actually quite complicated. The inside curvature of the knee is bigger than the outside curvature. And if you've all swung something overhead, you know, the longer the string, the slower it moves. So the outside curvature has a smaller surface uh, curvature, which means that it rotates backwards at a faster rate than the inside. The net effect of that as the knee bends, if this is the outside part of the knee, is that it's going to go backwards through the arc of motion faster. And it actually rotates the bottom bone into what we call external rotation. So if the knee were a hinge joint, it would be simple. We could get a joint replacement like we had with a door hinge, put a pin through it, everything would be easy. But it's not. And those subtle differences in the biomechanics are really kind of important when we talk about having a normal functioning knee that feels like your own knee. The knee relies on ligaments for stability, and what I want you to focus on here is these. These two ligaments, they're blurry and I apologize, but on the side of the knee it's called the lateral collateral ligament and the medial collateral ligament. They're very important for how your knee functions and how a knee replacement functions. Okay, um, <clears throat> we're going to get more into that in a minute. When we talk about dynamic and static stabilizers, we're talking also about the muscles that cross the knee. The muscles that cross the knee, namely the quad muscle, the hamstring muscles, the biggest muscles in the body, provide some stability in addition to those ligaments. You've probably all heard of an ACL tear. It's a common athletic injury. The ACL is one of four collateral ligaments that provides stability to the knee. And in some patients, especially who are not high-level athletes, you can overcome an ACL tear by strengthening up the hamstrings and stabilizing the knee from the back with the muscles. So the stability in the knee is really kind of um, complicated. For the hip, the hip is a much simpler joint. It's a ball and socket joint, okay? It's pretty, it's pretty easy to picture this one in your mind. You have a ball, you have a socket, and you have rotation within the socket. The shoulder is also a ball and socket joint. But if you think about the physics of how this works, if you have a big socket and a small ball, that's, the joint is very stable. The shoulder has a very small socket and a large ball, so it's inherently unstable. The advantage is that you can position your shoulder pretty much anywhere in space, and that's unique to humans, right? Because we walk on two feet. So we're designed to be able to reach up and grab that fruit off the tree, right? So, <clears throat> but the hip joint doesn't need to do that. You can't have the same arc of motion in your hip that you have in your shoulder. The advantage comes with hip replacement that the biomechanics are much simpler. It's inherently a more stable joint, even though it does have ligamentous and muscle connections like the knee, but it's very stable and therefore very simple to replace. We don't have complicated mechanics like one side rotating faster than the other, okay? We don't have as shallow of a surface um, as we do in the knee. So hip replacements were one of the first joints that, that were ever replaced, and it's a very good surgery. It carries with a very high success rate. Just with any, no matter how the hip replacement is done, there still are advantages in some of the newer technologies that have come along, and we're going to talk about that. So arthritis of the knee, this is just a quick little diagram giving you an idea. If we were to look at a perfect knee, nice smooth, white or grayish white articular cartilage, little bit of damage, further damage, more damage. And when we look at this with a camera, if we were to do a knee scope, it looks very similar. Arthritis of the hip. When arthritis of the hip happens, we see the same thing. We see damage to the white cartilage on top and we see damage on the socket side as well. And actually in the hip, the bones will actually start to change shape in later uh, stages of arthritis. It does so in the knee too, but in the hip it's very easily noticeable on most uh, x-rays of severe arthritis. So what is a knee replacement, right? A knee replacement, there's different kinds of knee replacements. The most commonly done one, up to 900,000 a year in the United States, is a total knee replacement. A total knee replacement replaces all parts of the knee. And when we talk about the knee, we talk about the inside part, the outside part, and this part under the kneecap called the patellofemoral joint. So the three compartments are three parts of the knee, medial, lateral, and patellofemoral, okay? 
Partial knee replacement, as it's showing you here in this diagram, only replaces one part of the knee. Okay, so if you have arthritis in one area, that can be theoretically beneficial. But that's not always the case. In fact, it's quite frequent, frequently not the case. And more total knee replacements are done um, than partial knee replacements throughout the country each year. So this, this is the meat of the presentation. This concept that we're gonna discuss right here is gonna help explain why robotics is, nef is, um, is different and what the advantages of robotics is in knee replacement versus standard knee replacement. And it comes from how we put the knee replacement in, the position of the knee replacement within the knee, okay? We're gonna do some x-rays here and we're gonna let you guys be doctors for a sec, okay? A traditional knee replacement which was called mechanical alignment. The goal of mechanical alignment was to have a nice straight line from the center of the hip to the middle of the ankle with the knee in the middle. If you notice this part, the bottom part called the tibial component because it goes in the tibial bone is 90 degrees or perpendicular to the long axis of the leg, okay? And the thought was, well, you wouldn't build your house on a crooked foundation. So why would we put a knee replacement in any other way but 90 degrees to the axis of the, of the extremity. It bears weight evenly, and it should last longer because we're not gonna have uneven wear on the parts of the knee, right? It turns out that the literature doesn't suggest that those parts wear out any, any later if you do it this way, or if you put it in in a different way. And the question then became that some surgeons years ago started doing with something called the kinematic technique is, should we be correcting deformity? Should we be taking people who are bow-legged or knock-kneed and straightening them out and changing the way that they walk and the way that they bear weight on their knee? And <clears throat> even since my training, I started residency in five and I finished in 10, there were different products that were coming out that were saying, you don't have to put the knee in like this, right? And the results were pretty good. They weren't bad. Patients were liking putting knee replacements in crooked, if you want to call it that, right? Because we weren't trying to change their anatomy. We weren't trying to adjust how they're bearing weight on their bones, okay? And so I did knee replacements like this for 10 years, and they did well. They had about an 80% success rate. With a hip replacement, the sex success rate, because of the simpler mechanics, is close to 95%. It's almost as good as surgery, one of the best surgeries that we have in medicine up right up there with cardiac uh, bypass grafting. It's that successful, right? So, well, if we're not gonna put it in straight, then how are we gonna put it in? We talk about functional alignment. And remember those ligaments that I talked to you about on the sides of the knee? The knee doesn't have a hinge in it. There's no pin going through connecting the top bone to the bottom, right? So what balances the knee throughout its range of motion is the tension on the ligaments on the side. If those ligaments are loose, or maybe loose on the outside, but tight on the inside, it's an unbalanced knee. And we know that patients aren't necessarily gonna be satisfied with that knee replacement, okay? An unbalanced knee, traditionally with mechanical alignment, when we make the cut 90 degrees to the axis of the leg, we would say, well, it's a little tight on the inside, I'm gonna release some soft tissue over here. I'm gonna you know, release some of the MCL or the posterior capsule. And I'm gonna try and make that gap a little wider by making adjustments to the soft tissue envelope around the knee, right? And so that's more cutting. That's more releasing and soft tissue releasing. And the principle behind functional alignment, okay, is that we're gonna position the knee replacement to put equal tension on those ligaments. We're gonna change slightly the orientation of the prosthesis itself to balance the tension on those ligaments, okay? And with that principle, we see slightly better um, recovery and higher patient satisfaction, okay? Now robotics comes along, and how does that play into this? The robot, <coughs> these, these are the two robots we have at Lehigh Valley. The Velis robotic system, which we have in Hazleton, it's by one company called Depuy Synthes, 
and the Mako robotic system by another company called Stryker. Okay, the Mako is not available in Hazleton, but we do have it within Lehigh Valley Health Network. The robots allow us to test the motion of the knee in real time. We're going to tell the knee where, tell the robot where your knee is in space, okay? Once we make our incision, we open the knee, we use a little marker. These robotic eyes, right? We will tell the robot, this point, this point, this point, this point, this is where the knee is. And the distance between these, these pins that we insert in the, in the leg are a fixed mathematical dis distance. So the robot can now picture three-dimensionally where your knee is in space, okay? It works similarly to the way a robotic arm would work on an assembly line. If a robotic arm has to provide a weld on an assembly line, it knows right where to make that weld based on three-dimensional relationships and mathematical relationships. So basically what we kind of did here and what orthopedics has done is we take that assembly line principle of using a robotic arm and we apply it to each patient's own unique anatomy, okay? Before we start, the robot will tell us this patient is six degrees bow-legged or varus deformity, and their range of motion is from 10 degrees, slight bent, to maybe 125 degrees, right? And so we know, when we're starting, where your deformity is, okay? And do we try to correct it all the way to neutral? No, no. We adopt the functional principle. We use the robotic software to position the knee replacement three-dimensionally within the software, which is what uh, the next screen is, right? And it's telling us these are our gaps, our spaces, our distances through range of motion. These are, this is the amount of bone we're gonna remove here, here, and here. This is how the, the prosthesis is gonna fit. We know before we even do anything to the knee what your gaps are gonna look like. So we don't have to worry so much about getting an asymmetric gap, okay? We don't have to worry about, you know, when I put this knee replacement in, is it gonna be loose on the outside and tight in the inside? We already know because we've tested it in real time where this knee replacement's gonna come out. So the robot gives us a precise and reproducible way to do functional alignment of knee replacement, okay? And it gives us other advantages too. We can take this component here, this cap, and we can flex it, bend it down. We can adjust it left and right, side to side. And we can adjust um, everything about it, the slope of the replacement and what we need to do, meaning the tilt on the bottom part, okay? Um, so with this, how has robotic uh, knee replacement fared in the literature? If you look at these studies, the point here really is look at the dates of these studies, right? 2018, 2022, right? And the last one I can't remember, 2021. So we're talking some pretty recent data. Now keep in mind, when you're doing a study, a medical study, it takes a long time to produce this data, right? People have to be enrolled, study has to be approved before it even gets enrolled. People get enrolled, they recover the data, they analyze the data, they look at it, and then they publish months after that. So this, this data, even though it's being published in these months, these studies were going on likely for years before that, okay? We're starting to see that with functional alignment and with the use of the robot, we can increase patient satisfaction, increase the speed of recovery, okay? Now, when you get further out from, from the time of surgery, the data kind of balances out a little bit. And we, we don't have, you know, data that necessarily says that there's an advantage to robotics or not after, say, six months or so, okay? But in that first three to six months, and just talking from my own personal experience, having done it the other way for 10 years and using robotics for the last two to three, I noticed that my patients seem happier and they come in and they recover, they get to walking quicker, okay? They seem a little bit happier with their knee replacement, particularly those patients that have a pretty good deformity. If they're rather bow-legged or knock-kneed, you know, we're not correcting that all the way back to neutral, and they seem happier with their knees than when I was doing it the traditional way. So, how precise is the robot? 
Well, we have to make cuts in the bone to position the implant on the bone. It's accurate within a half a millimeter of accuracy on each side of the joint, right? And orthopedics is one of those things where these small differences make, make a lot of difference. If you have one gap on one side of the joint, that's maybe four or five millimeters, which is not a lot, right? Small, I mean, we don't usually think in millimeters, but you know, think of a you know, quarter of an inch or so, and the other side is, is tighter by a quarter of an inch or four, five millimeters. Um, you know, it's not, it can result in a patient who's not happy with their knee. It feels unstable to them. It doesn't quite feel right. You know, and so these small differences, it's really important that we have that precision, that we have that accuracy. And most robotic systems are about a half a millimeter of accuracy on either side of the joint. So a total of one millimeter of accuracy between the top and the bottom bone, the femur and the tibia. So this is company sponsored. We'll see if it works here. This is from Depuy Synthes Company and it is a YouTube video. When preparing for a knee replacement surgery, you may be interested in learning how advanced technology will be used in your procedure. Depew Synthes, a leader in orthopedics, offers the Velis Robotic Assisted Solution designed for digital precision in knee replacement to help you start moving again. Let's take a closer look at how the technology works. The system includes a robotic assisted device, a high-speed camera, optical trackers, and data screens designed to help surgeons achieve the highest possible precision level. With the Velis Robotic Assisted Solution, surgeons are in control during the entire procedure. The device does not move or operate on its own. Your surgeon will start the procedure by making an incision in your knee. Next, they attach trackers to your knee, which work with the camera to gain the information needed to perform your procedure. From this information, the surgeon creates a 3D model of your knee. Your surgeon will move your leg back and forth to test the function of your knee. This will help assess your full leg alignment and soft tissue tension. During your procedure, your surgeon continually gathers data related to your knee to help them perform a precise knee replacement surgery personalized to your specific anatomy. This process helps your surgeon optimize the outcome with the use of data that's unique to you. Designed for precision, this advanced technology can help your surgeon visualize and predict the stability of your knee joint, find a favorable implant fit, and perform a highly accurate knee restoration. To restore your knee, the surgeon guides the robotic device to remove the damaged bone and cartilage in your knee making sure it matches the surgical plan. The technology software is used to verify your final alignment and balance. The implant components are placed and your surgeon will check the range of motion. Then your surgeon will remove the trackers and close the incision site. After the surgery is complete, your care team will work with you on developing a post-surgery recovery plan. For more information, ask your surgeon how the Velis Robotic Assisted Solution can help you start moving again. And so, this is one of the two robots. The, the Striker robot actually is the older robotic system, and it's a good system, and it's, it works well. I used that when I was in Delaware quite frequently. Um, but, you know, the principles are the same across no matter what robotic system you're using. Um, a lot of people come in and, you know, it's funny, they say, oh, well, you're going to do a robotic knee, where will you be? Like, I'm going to be out getting a coffee or something, and <laughs> like, I'm going to press the button and the robot does all the work. It, I swear that's not true. In, in both systems, what, what's happening is that the robotic arm is telling us where to make the cuts so that we recreate the plan that we created in the design software. And so my hand controls it. So I know, you know, having done plenty of knee replacements, how deep to make the cuts, where to make the cuts, and, and I'm still in control, which is, which is nice. Um, so it's similar to, you know, there is no robotics in, in medicine that I'm aware of right now where the robot does the work. Even the Da Vinci system, which you guys see for, you know, gallbladders, tumors, and things like that. Um, you know, the surgeon's in the, in the corner of the room controlling it unsterily. With this system, we are sterile, we're prepped, we're right there, you know? So, um, you know, it's, it's in my control, but I'm still a surgeon, I'm still operating, uh, which I, I really like that. If it ever gets to fully robotic, uh, I think it's time for me to retire. <laughs>
but okay. So the patient-specific approach. We now know we've discussed how robotics are specific to patients, right? Well, how do we assess that tension, okay? One of the things that we can use, and this is a tool that I use quite frequently, is we make one cut and we put this little device in there called the tensioner. And the tensioner has a set tension in the springs that we can assess with use of the robot, the tension on the ligaments through range of motion. It helps us, again, more accurately predict that tension that we're gonna have from straight knee throughout the range of motion to the flex knee, okay? And so this is something that we use. We're getting early data back on this, and the data that's been coming out is, is quite good. Again, we're repositioning the knee replacement according to what your anatomy tells us, so we don't have to release soft tissues as to one side that's tight. I used to do soft tissue releases on probably half of my knees when I was doing mechanical alignment. Now I'd say I'd do it on maybe 5%. You know, the robot is accurate enough that we're close enough that we don't have to do that. So again, we talked about this. How does a robotic knee replacement reduce t pain? No need for soft tissue balancing. We achieve that with the implant. And in my experience, in my experience with patients who've had robotic knees, um, they say it feels more like their own knee. Uh, it's not uncommon to see a patient at three months who comes in and they're like, yeah, this is, this is great. With traditional knee replacement, I don't recall seeing it quite as early. We have something that we actually measure in orthopedics called the FJI, Forgotten Joint Index, which is the point at which you forget that you had your knee replaced, all right? There's, it ha seems to happen sooner with functional alignment and robotic placement of knee replacements than it did over the traditional mechanical alignment. Because of all these things that we've discussed, I've adopted knee replacement for 100% of my knees, a robotic knee replacement for 100% of my knees, okay? I, I can't do as reproducible a knee replacement without the robot as I can with it. And so even if you don't have much deformity, if your leg isn't very crooked, in my hands, I feel as though I deliver a more consistent result by using the robot than not using it. The potential risks of the robot are small, okay? The reasons that surgeons don't use robotics is, uh, has to do with OR time. We do have to put two pins in the thigh bone and in the shin bone so that holds those paddles so that the knee knows where they are. And if you're putting little holes in the bone, you could have a fracture through the bone. I've never had one, don't ever want to have one, but it's theoretically possible, right? Um, the other thing is the, the increase in robotic time. When you're first learning robotics, it increases your time pretty significantly. A high volume knee replacement surgeon can do his part of the knee replacement within about 30 minutes. Some even have the skin closed in 30 minutes, but most, it's about a half an hour to have the implants in and start closing the wound, okay? And so when I first started doing these, it was taking longer. It was taking an hour or more, you know? And it, it took practice and it took time and the whole team, the physician assistants, the scrub techs, everybody to be involved and be on the same page. And on average, we have implants in now between 28 and 35 minutes is our average time. So it really hasn't delayed me with experience over uh, standard knee replacement. So one important thing to discuss is pain control and what else are we doing other than robotics? What is a modern knee replacement entail? These things have come along and these techniques have come along in the last 10 to 15 years. And it's important that you understand that knee replacement is not what it used to be, okay? When I first started doing knee replacements or seeing them really, I was a medical student, we're talking 2003. Um, everybody would get a knee replacement, they'd get a tourniquet, put on their leg for the surgery. Uh, we would do the surgery, take the tourniquet down. The tourniquet would frequently get inflated to three or 350 millimeters mercury, which is much higher than the incoming blood pressure. The tourniquet would be up for anywhere from, you know, 30 to 60 minutes and then come down. The patient would go to the floor. They would get a pain button to push for pain medication called PCA or patient controlled analgesia. You press a button, it gives you a little dose of morphine. They'd be there for two to three days and then they were automatically accepted into a rehab, inpatient rehab facility for having one knee done, okay? And they all went to the rehab facilities. So that's 2003. 20 years later in 2023, what are we doing differently? Well, we've studied how do we give the patient a better experience? What can we do to reduce pain you know, around the time of surgery and get a patient moving quicker. So, multimodal pharmacologic treatment of perioperative pain. There's multiple studies on this. We don't just give you a pain button to push after surgery, okay? We can reduce pain by using different medications. We give 
a Tylenol a, a medication uh, called Affirmiv, or um, uh, it's, a, it's basically an IV Tylenol. We sometimes give oral Tylenol, Celebrex, or an anti-inflammatory medication, and gabapentin, a nerve medication. So we're addressing pain on multiple fronts. We're addressing it through the nerve receptors um, that, are, that are pain modulated with gabapentin. We're addressing anti-inflammatory pain. We frequently give a dose of an IV steroid, okay? So we're reducing further inflammation with that, okay? Through these techniques, we apply them with spinal anesthesia or regional blocks, which means that you don't, for, for most joint replacements, you don't get an inhaled anesthetic. You get a spinal or an epidural and you're numb from the bottom down, from top middle section down for about two hours. Plenty of time to get the surgery done. You wake up with no pain because you're numb from the waist down. You're not having that sudden and excruciating onset of pain. We can use blocks where we will block, say, what we call an adductor canal block. They put, use a needle, find a nerve right in this area, which numbs a lot of the area around the knee. Okay, doesn't get it all, but it numbs it. So we're getting a handle on this pain using multiple new methods before the pain gets severe. And that's really the key to getting a patient moving quickly, right? Because those old days, pressing buttons for PCA, morphine has bad effects, it sedates you, it constipates you. We used to see people get what we called a post-op ileus. Their bowel wouldn't work from all the narcotics that they were getting, it was slowed down and it was a complication that you know wasn't common, but we saw it. In, in modern years, I hardly ever see it with these newer techniques, right? What else can we do? Liposomal bupivacaine, it's a fancy name for a drug called Expirel. And basically what they're doing is we're taking um, Marcaine, a common numbing agent, we're injecting it in the tissues around the knee and it can provide up to 48 hours to 72 hours of relief, two to three days of a numbing effect on the tissue. And then we can use something called genicular nerve cryo cryoneurolysis, which is a fancy name for liquid nitrogen in the, around the nerves in the knee before surgery. We don't yet have this at Lehigh Valley. We're working on getting it. There's early data coming out that if you freeze these nerves before surgery, you can reduce postoperative pain by 30, 40%, right? So we have all these new, these new techniques that we didn't have before. I'll talk briefly about unicompartmental knee replacement. I didn't want to skip it because it does apply to robotics. If you have arthritis in only one part in the knee, you would say, why do I want to replace the other two parts? That are, that are not arthritic, and that's a good argument. And that works for a lot of people. The other thing that, that a lot of people don't know about a knee replacement is the vast majority of knee replacements sacrifice the ACL. That ligament that you hear that we spend all this time reconstructing for athletes and things like that, yeah, for knee replacements, we bag it. We, there's a different way that we account for it. We build, for front to back stability, we build parts into the prosthesis that account for that, but the ligament itself is sacrificed. For most people with medial compartment arthritis, meaning the inside, this is the fibula or the outer bone, if you have severe arthritis here, but your kneecap and the other side of your knee are okay, you may be a candidate for a unicompartmental partial knee replacement. That is done with, a different, with, the, with the Mako robot, and it has the advantages of most patients, say, giving them a knee that feels more like their own. And it's a quicker recovery because obviously there's less bony cuts and less dissection. The robot assesses that gap on the inside part of the knee and provides a symmetric balance throughout the arc of motion, just like it does for a full knee replacement. The downside of a partial knee replacement, um, they last about 10 years. Full knee replacement, 15 to 25, right? Um, if you're a younger patient and you have knee arthritis in only one part of the knee, that might be a good option for you because the second surgery, a knee replacement, which you're gonna, you know, if you're say 40 or 45, and you have severe arthritis, 20 years, you're gonna need a redo of your knee replacement. It is a lot easier to redo a uni, uh, partial knee replacement than it is to redo a full knee replacement. So the robot for that is the Mako, and the literature really strongly supports use of the robotics in partial knee replacement, particularly for improved component positioning, uh, which equates to less risk of complications. The rehabilitation after surgery, we're just gonna to touch on this, but one of the things that we do, and I don't know how many people know this, if you have a joint replacement, be it hip or knee, and we're not talking about shoulders today, I admit, but hip or knee, um, we get you moving right away. We get you up and walk you the day of surgery. We wanna see you walk about 10 feet with a walker, and then we hope for 40 to 100 feet on the next day. Some patients, a lot of patients, if you're healthy uh, and doing well, can go home the same day. You have to qualify for that. 
And there's a lot of other things that have to happen, right? It's a lot easier to go home the same day if your surgery's in the morning versus if it's at two or three o'clock in the afternoon, you know, because you don't have as much time to recover. Most patients stay one night and go home the next day. And that's what we're doing at Hazleton with robotics right now. During COVID, I had a lot of my patients go home the same day because we didn't have a choice because the hospital was full of COVID. So we had to evolve these methods to get patients home the same day. And we're doing that here and we're working on that right now at Hazleton as well. And we do have that available at other locations throughout Lehigh Valley Health Network, uh, which I also work. We're gonna talk real quick about hip replacement. And what I wanna focus here is how do you do a hip replacement? The traditional hip replacement is called a posterior approach. We make an incision, a curved incision, through the buttock with the position, patient position sideways. After we do that, we cut this muscle, the gluteus maximus. We cut these muscles called the short external rotators. We peel those back, and then what you're looking at here is the back side of the hip, or, hip uh, joint. With the anterior approach, this approach came along. It was uh, pioneered by a guy named Joel Mata. He was one of the, the big ones to promote this. I actually got to do a few training sessions with him. He's a doctor out of California and he's done thousands of these. We take this incision and we move it to the front of the hip, okay? And on the front of the hip, we have these muscles that we can simply pull aside. We don't have to cut them, we don't have to dissect them, we can pull them aside, and we're looking right at the hip joint. Once we retract these muscles, this is the internal covering of the hip joint. And then this one we're done is essentially what we're looking at. Muscles retracted on the side, the hip replacement on position in the middle, all right? So, what is important about, um, about anterior approach hip replacement, not only that it spares muscles, but it also lets us recreate anatomy. Why? If you're positioned on your side, it's hard to shoot an x-ray. But if you're positioned on your back, it's very easy to shoot an x-ray. And we can reproduce anatomically this distance called the offset. We can reproduce the distance between here because don't forget, when you put this hip replacement in, you're gonna be changing this distance and this distance, side to side. So we can actually take an image and flip the image over and reproduce those distances. So the chance of coming out with slightly different anatomy or one leg that's longer than the other, which is a real, it's a real you know, thing that happens with hip, replace, with hip replacement is less. If you're positioned on your side and we can't use x-ray, how do we know if the leg is the appropriate length? Well, we kind of feel and we say, you know, yeah, that feels about right. And if we move the leg around, it seems stable, you know. But, um, <laughs> you know, to be honest, the use of x-ray uh, is one major advantage for uh, anterior approach hip replacement. Hip navigation has come along even further. So we can do a preoperative plan with a computer and a template before we actually do the surgery, right? So what we're looking at here is an x-ray. You can see there's bone in the back here, and we've superimposed a hip replacement to tell us this distance, this distance, the fit in the canal, the fit of the cup in the socket. A hip replacement has two main parts, the stem going down into the thigh bone and the metallic cup in the socket. And unlike knee replacement, they're almost always pressed into the bone. Knee replacement, a lot of people are still doing replacements where we cement the knee into the bone. For my preference, if your knee and your bone is strong enough, we press it into the bone. And if you have some soft bone and we need to cement it to make sure that it's stable and fixed to the bone, we will cement it into the bone. But hip replacements, I very rarely do cemented hip replacements anymore. Um, they're almost always press fit into the bone um, and they do well. Robotic assisted hip replacement, this is something that has come along. I have not adopted this. I had certification, I went to the courses on this. Why have I not adopted it? Because I don't see a huge advantage over anterior approach hip replacement. For posterior approach, for those patients that can't have an anterior approach, it makes sense to use it through the buttock because this will tell you exactly where your components are positioned, particularly your cup. It's really important how we position that cup. And this will tell you where those things are um, before we do that. The other thing is the software can account for spinal pelvic motion. What is spinal pelvic motion? We know that the lumbar spine is connected to the pelvis, right? You all picture a skeleton, you have the, the spine coming down the back and your pelvis, which contains your hip sockets. The motion between the lumbar spine and the pelvis is important because one of the complications with hip replacement is dislocation. And we found that if you have a stiff or fused lumbar spine from prior surgery, you're more likely to have a dislocation. Going through the back of the hip is more likely to have a dislocation than going through the front, okay? And so when we, when we can assess three-dimensionally how that hip is gonna move, 
before it pops out of the socket, there's a big advantage to that. And the robotic software does give us some advantages in that. So again, from a posterior approach, meaning going through the buttock, with a higher chance of popping the hip out of the socket, I think there is some advantage to robotics. But for a standard anterior approach, we're preserving all those soft tissues on the back of the hip. So popping the hip out of the back of the socket is much less likely. Okay, so I'm gonna pass this over. I know that was kind of technical, but let's get into questions. Do you guys have any questions about you know, how this works and, and what we're doing with robotics and, and uh, pain control and things like that in joint replacement today? Yeah. How long will a knee or hip replacement last? Any bearing surface, it depends on how hard you use it. Um, different implants have different uh, rates of survival, which we're, we're checking. Um, but yeah, on average, I tell my patients 15 to 25 years for a knee replacement. Can robotic surgery be used for a revision surgery? That's a good question. And so robotic knee replacement is best applied to what we call primary knee or the first knee replacement. There have been, and I have used in some instances for um, revision knee replacement, that is evolving right now at a lot of the centers. They're looking at when we redo the knee, can we assess the same gaps and tension on the ligaments in revision. So my answer to you is not yet, but I think that that is coming. How long is the recovery time for a knee or hip replacement? Knee replacement is a very good surgery, but it's not a perfect surgery. In an ideal world, we would give you back the cartilage that you had in your knee like you're 18, right? But we don't have the technology to do that. So if your definition of recovery is walking around day to day with minimal to no pain, that's what we call that forgotten joint index. And on average with a standard knee replacement, it's about four to six months. With robotics, we're seeing more like three to four months. That's what I'm experiencing in my practice. Um, and so most patients that come in and see me at two months are not using a cane or a walker. Now, if you were using one before surgery, you're more likely to need it for longer after. But most patients are not using a cane or a walker at two months, and most patients by three months are starting to walk distance or walk for exercise. It is always hard to kneel on a knee replacement, no matter how it's done. You're never going to kick yourself in the butt like you did when you were seven years old. <laughs> you, know? uh, you may not squat with your butt to the floor either with a knee replacement, no matter how it's done. That's just kind of limitations in, in the, in the uh, prosthesis itself. Are there complications or restrictions if you have scoliosis or a spinal deformity with a hip replacement? So yes, I have done, I've done about uh, four to 500 anterior approach hip replacements. And I can tell you I've done a handful of them in patients with severe scoliosis. They seem to do as well. Um, the, the problem when you get into scoliosis and any lumbar degeneration is the stress it puts on the back and the pelvis called the SI joints, right? Um, in my mind, if your lower lumbar spine is immobile, it's still better to do an anterior approach because we preserve all those tissues on the back of the hip. And as you can imagine, if this is your hip standing, when you sit, you go into what we call hip flexion. If those tissues on the back are not, are not there, it's easier to out the back, particularly if you cross your legs uh, or fall with your leg coming across the body. Um, so whenever I can, I try to do an anterior approach hip replacement, even in a scoliotic patient for that reason. If you had spinal surgery, will it cause complications or restrictions with a knee or hip replacement? And it's important to understand that whether it's a knee or a hip replacement, the, those, those issues don't always correct your other issues. If you have a bad back and you have what we call spinal stenosis, um, or you have numbness in your feet from peripheral neuropathy or from a back injury, or you have a weak leg and you can't pick your foot up great, those, those issues aren't gonna be solved obviously by your knee or your hip replacement. So those are still limitations impairing your ability to walk. Now, <clears throat> as a surgeon, when we assess a patient, we want to know where the pain is coming from. So you frequently will receive injections in the knee and other things of that nature that if they work and they help reduce your pain and help you walk even for a temporary time, we can feel pretty comfortable that the pain is coming from the knee itself and that you would benefit from a knee replacement. So we use some of those things to determine. What are gel injections for non-surgical treatment of chronic knee pain? So let's talk about those gel shots. Um, I, we didn't talk about treatments before uh, for time's sake. We didn't talk about treatments before uh, joint replacement here. The gel shots is one of those treatments. Now I've come through the era where gel shots were given 
um, like crazy. We gave a lot of them, okay? And uh, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, which is our kind of governing and overseeing body in this country, they have what they call clinical use recommendations, meaning how well does this treatment work for this disease? And obviously one of the big ones is arthritis, right? So for patients with osteoarthritis, the most commonly found arthritis in cases of more severe arthritis, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons changed their clinical use guidelines from recommend to do not recommend because we found that for patients with severe arthritis, the gel shots just don't work well. Now, gel shots are very safe. They're a protein, not a drug like a steroid. The chance of seeing a complication like an allergy or, or infection from a gel shot is slim. So a lot of patients who just for whatever reason don't or can't have knee replacement opt to try them anyway. But what you've experienced is in my opinion, what most people experience with gel shots who have severe arthritis. You can try it, but I don't, you know, I'm not gonna say I told you so, but they, they don't always work great. Um, and in fact, a lot of people are better to just go on and get the knee replacement if they have that kind, that level of debilitating pain than to proceed through the gel shots. Because the other downside of the gel shots, like a steroid, right? Steroids usually take longer than 24 hours to kick in, all right? They usually take about two to three weeks to full effect. But that's a pretty quick effect after the shot. With a gel shot, let's say you get the three shot one, or you're brave enough to get the one shot one, which is a big bolus with a giant needle, and I hate giving it to people, okay? <laughs> because they curse, curse me out. But <laughs> the, the three shot one, let's assume you get one of those. Um, you get one shot a week for three weeks. The peak effect uh, doesn't come from the gel shot until about four or five weeks after the third shot. So you're two months into the treatment with the gel shot before you see the peak effect. And so for some people, they get relief early on, but a lot of people, they have to wait. Then you're not eligible for the next course of gel shots until you're six months, so four months later. Does it last six months in patients with severe arthritis? I would say not typically. Okay, so I don't push the gel shots, but I do offer them for people who are looking for an alternative. What is the best material to use for a knee or hip replacement? The one that I use most often is ceramic on plastic, a ceramic ball with a plastic liner in the metal cup, and why is that? It has excellent laboratory and clinical data regarding wear rates. And the sooner the plastic wears out, the sooner the hip replacement fails. In both knee and hip replacement, your body actually acts to, reacts to that, that plastic dust and that debris and it eats it up. And unfortunately, it also eats the bone with it. So hip replacements fail after a long period of time by having too much of that plastic dust. So over the years, we've evolved to understand through the literature and research that if you have certain treatments for that plastic liner and you use a ceramic head, you significantly reduce that, that wear. Um, but a hip replacement is a bearing as is a knee replacement. The more cycles you put through it and the more weight you put through it, the sooner it wears out. The other alternatives, metal on plastic. That was the traditional one, okay? Metal on plastic doesn't have as favorable wear weights as ceramic on plastic, so I hardly ever use it, hardly ever. Um, ceramic on ceramic. Ceramic on ceramic, a ceramic liner with a ceramic ball has the best wear rates and we think could last 25, maybe 30 years, right? Guess what the downside is? Some of them squeak. <laughs> you could be walking down the hall, er, 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 and it's not your shoes. Yeah, the thing is, um, it, it doesn't happen much anymore, okay? Um, that was with original ceramics, um, and we found that it has to do with cup positioning. If that ball is loading the edge of the liner, that's more common. Um, the other downside of ceramics is ceramics are brittle, right? So if you jump out of the back of the truck or sustain a load to your, to your hip really quick, it can break and it can shatter, and I've seen that. And when it happens, it's not fun to clean up, okay, because those shards and stuff, they, they get everywhere. Now, that being said, I've done ceramic on ceramic, particularly and mostly for my younger patients who are, um, who, yeah, who, they're athletic or they, they need that hip to last as long as possible. I had, a, I had a patient I did a hip replacement on, she was 20, 20, I think, or 21. She had a child at 19, and some people, for whatever reason, after pregnancy, can develop a raging case of rheumatoid arthritis, and she had that happen, and so we, we did a ceramic on ceramic, and I haven't seen her in 10 years, but I think she's doing okay. Um, so we do use it occasionally. The one big one you're gonna hear about if you research it is metal on metal. Okay, a metal, metal ball with a metal liner, 
and there's been a lot of controversy over this. They were very popular when I was going through my residency. Um, in fact, I have family members who have a metal on metal hip uh, called a hip resurfacing, a slightly different thing than a hip replacement. And um, they found that this metallic debris can get into your bloodstream. We don't know the effects of it. We don't think it's carcinogenic, but we don't really know. The other thing is it can cause something called a pseudotumor. And what is a pseudotumor? It's not an actual tumor, but it's a growth. It's a mass within the, within the pelvis. And sometimes these things can be huge. Um, so we, as orthopedic surgeons as a whole, have strayed away from metal on metal. They had great longevity because they're hard surface on a hard surface and they don't shatter. But for that reason, we've strayed away from them. So ceramic on plastic is what 95% of my patients get. How long will it take to schedule my knee or hip replacement? Um, there's a lot of things that come into play. Everybody who has a joint replacement, be it hip or knee, gets blood work, a chest x-ray, and an EKG typically before surgery. We want to make sure you're healthy before we operate on you. That's what it is. A lot of, we ask you to see your medical doctor who knows you, and if you have a cardiologist who knows you, we ask you to see them. You know, the, that's been researched a lot, is that wasteful spending, do patients need that? And it goes back and forth. Um, but, you know, to date, I haven't had a patient have a ma major episode on the table. I've been doing this 13 years. Yeah, thank God is right. And uh, I don't ever want it to happen. So that's a system I've always used, so I continue to use it today. What determines the size of the knee or hip replacement needed? The nice thing is the robot tells us the size. Okay, and we can adjust in the software up and down on the size if we don't like what we see in the screen. Traditionally, when you would do a knee replacement, you use calipers that measure just kind of, you know, um, front to back and, you know, not always side to side. Um, the implant that I'm using gives you narrow options, which means that the, the implant is a little narrower, but it's the same size front to back. I find that particularly helpful in women uh, because women have tend to have narrower knees. Um, and sometimes if you have little metal overhanging one place or another, there can be problematic. That's supposedly one of the advantages of a 3D printed knee. Uh, so there's advantages, disadvantages on both sides, um, but the size is determined by the robotic software, which I can adjust at the time of surgery. Thank you everybody for coming, it was great, I really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, if you need appointments, they can get y'all set up and, uh, and we'll go from there, okay? Thank you, yeah, appreciate it.